Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is a panel discussion that was planned to give you some insights into the uh, presentations of the artwork that you saw today. Uh, I am Jamie Vernon, uh, Executive Director and CEO of Sigma Xi, the Scientific Research Honor Society. We are a multidisciplinary honor society with members all over the world. We promote interdisciplinary collaborations and, and today is a great example of the, the type of work that we like to uh, encourage. I'd like to start off by recognizing our, our brilliant creator and curator, uh, Ms. Esther Malou, for bringing everyone together today. I think without a doubt, uh, this has been a success just in the collaborations that have happened uh, to lead up to this point, but I'm hoping that further uh, advancement of these ideas will, will develop today as we go through the conversation and, and afterwards. So I'd also like to thank those who made it possible for us to be here at St. Ignatius Church today on the campus of University of San Francisco. So thank you all for that. So the concept of this art exhibit is really, are there parallels between the furthest reaches of the universe and the foundations of human consciousness? And I believe that some of the projects we saw today, all the projects today, uh, tried to identify those similarities or differences. And, and, and I'm looking forward to getting some more details from the artists and the scientists who participated. The concept for the exhibit actually came from a conversation uh, that Esther had with a neurosurgeon, I believe. And it was really talking about, I guess the conversation was about how some neuroscientists had partnered with artists. Uh, and then there became a, a, a little, uh, they delved into a little more detail about how you could actually expand that by bringing in scientists from different disciplines to work with artists as well. And could that lead to the advancement of interdisciplinary work and, and interdisciplinary concepts? And the idea is to elevate the field of science art through these interdisciplinary collaborations. Uh, science art is not new. In fact, it's been going on for many years and it's been uh, adopted more recently by the academic community, the education community, as a, as a tool for teaching uh, science. And I think that that is something that we're excited about, uh, any lessons that can be taken today uh, into the academic education world and, and used to further advance art in science. And there's, but there's limited knowledge about the process of forming these collaborations and what the, the unfolds during those collaborations that could further advance research as well as education and art. Now there's no guarantee that any of these collaborations is going to be successful. Uh, I think the question is how do you define success? Uh, and, and that actually leads us to you know, are, are these projects the projects that the scientist envisioned? Are they the projects that the artist envisioned? Um, there's no guarantee for that, but there is a guarantee that new relationships will be formed and that new ideas and concepts could potentially form in, through those collaborations. And so the relationship between the disciplines becomes the focus, and we start to think about how we can encourage those relationships, and that becomes the goal. So on today's panel, we have representatives from each of some of the projects today, not all. Uh, as far as the astrophysicists go, we have Dr. David Weinberg. <laughs> Distingu he's a distinguished university professor and chair of the Department of Astronomy at the, the Ohio State University. That's <laughs> we have Dr. Joel Primack. Distinguished Professor Emeritus at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Dr. Mark Nerink, the Iker Basque Fellow at the University of the Basque Country, Spain. And joining us remotely is Miguel Aragon Calvo, Assistant Professor at the National Astronomical Observatory, UNAM, Mexico. From the neuroscientists, I feel like I'm introducing a, a bout, a heavyweight bout. The neuroscientists with us, <laughs> Dr. Dan Feldman, professor of neurobiology at the University of California at Berkeley. Olaf Sporns is joining us online today. 
the Distinguished Professor in Psychological and Brain Sciences at Indiana University. Hi, Olaf. And Michael Silver, Professor of Vision, Science, Optometry, and uh, Neuroscience at the University of California, Berkeley. The artists, Thea Kenyon Boudhu. Did I say that right? Yeah. No? <laughs> How do I, correct me. Yeah, Thea. 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 Okay, good. Thank you for correcting me. She's an artist, a writer, and science advocate based here in San Francisco. Forrest Stearns, principal artist at Draw Everywhere, creative innovation consultant and artist in residence at Google Quantum AI in Santa Barbara. And Anastasia Victor, XR design artist, resident at Gray Area Foundation and Mozilla XR Studio. So the three concepts that are represented up here today are natural science. I think you saw that which was the fox that was dreaming and being, those dreams potentially being recorded and understanding the connection between those dreams and the universe. One in the universe was Anastasia's uh, project. And the undulating architecture illuminating the individual sciences by Forrest Stearns, which is being projected at the back of the room there. So let's dive into the conversation. This is the best part. To get us started, I'd like to ask someone on the panel, maybe a scientist, to volunteer to give a one minute, if possible, comparison between the brain and the cosmos. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, our modern theory of uh, the universe is very well confirmed, and in fact, uh, it was part of the reason that uh, the Nobel Prize was shared by Jim Peebles, that was just announced last week, uh, because we're really confident that we've got at least part of the story right. Uh, so according to our modern picture, the universe is organized as a big network. There are large regions called voids with hardly any galaxies. The voids are surrounded by sheets with a few galaxies. Our galaxy happens to lie in a sheet. The sheets are bounded by filaments, and that's actually where most of the galaxies are. And where the filaments cross are big clusters of galaxies. Any given region of the universe on large scales looks pretty much like any other region of the universe. The architecture doesn't have special uh, regions. The brain, our brain, any uh, vertebrate brain, uh, and even bird brains, are organized in a very different way. They're a network, but they have specialized regions. And there are super highways of communication between some of these specialized regions where information travels easily and rapidly. So in that regard, the neural network and the cosmic web are really very different. Also, the way they evolve and grow are very different. The cosmic web is not uh, a way of communication. The distances are far too great for any kind of uh, back and forth communication, whereas the whole point of the neural net is communication. So there are similarities, but also differences. Just one last comment. In working with Olaf Sparns, who's one of the great experts on how the nervous system is connected, especially the brain, <clears throat> I learned a lot about how to analyze networks. And I hadn't actually gone in that direction before in my own research. So it's actually having some impact on my research, because I've now started to think more uh, in a network way. Uh, thanks largely to what I learned from Olaf. So thanks, Olaf. That's great. That's great. So all of you scientists were asked to explore the similarities between the cosmos and the brain. And, and thank you, Joel, for giving us that great explanation. And, and actually, you addressed my next, my next question. Were you able to identify meaningful similarities? And are you able to draw any conclusions from those similarities that might lead us to think there is a connection between the structure of the universe and the structure of the brain? Um, so yeah, the the a lot of the the way a lot of the structure is fairly similar. So um, for this project, I'd I'd made some measurements of 
the connectivity of neurons um, from a database of neurons, and um, there's a, a relationship between the total length of the neuron, so if you sum up all of the little segments of the neuron um, and measure the whole length, um, and compare that to, to the, uh, the number of branches, um, the, so there's a relationship that, that uh, holds pretty well from neuron to neuron, um, and it sort of conserves the amount of material in a neuron. It, it makes sense that in our brains we don't want to waste a lot of neuronal material, um, and, that goes, and that relationship uh, happens to, to hold pretty well for uh, filaments around a cluster also, which was something that uh, I measured from the this Bolshoi, Bolshoi simulation that Joel and others are involved, involved with. Um, so I, I don't have an explanation for that, but it's, it's really curious. I mean, the, I don't know of a principle in cosmology that would um, conserve material like that, but it's interesting. <laughs> Anyone, would, you like to? would you like to make a con contribution? Um, I mean, one one of the, uh, concept that came up over and over again in, in the discussions among our team members was uh, self-similarity. And uh, that's often formalized in terms of fractals, but the, the idea that at very different spatial scales, you can see the same patterns that are replicated over and over again and then um, occur at the larger and both smaller scales as well. And I think that's definitely true for neural branching patterns. It's also true for the branches of trees and many other uh, structures in biology. But um, I understand from my physicist friends that it's very common in uh, the cosmos as well. And so that may be one kind of abstract but unifying principle about the structural similarities at the different uh, systems. Miguel, I, I want to give someone on the, that's remotely joining us the opportunity. I know that you have studied the similarities between the structure of the universe and not just the brain, but other uh, body parts, uh, bone formation, for example. Would you like to share any of your insights from that work or, or what you've learned from this particular project? I'm not sure that he can hear very well because of the because of all the echo. Oh, echo. <laughs> Miguel, can you can you hear the question there? I'm sorry. Uh, I can't hear you very well. Ah. So, okay. I think I will only listen. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, oh no. Can you Is, yeah. 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 Okay. Maybe you could yeah, email or text. In the meantime. In the meantime. So why you the microphone to Thank you. Hmm. One of the first things that occurred to me when I heard about, oh, it's the cosmos and this we've got this rendering of this big cosmic web thing, and then we've also got neuroscience and renderings of all of these neural connections was, okay, well, this is a classic example of, um, <laughs> of the map of something looking like a map of something and not necessarily of those things being inherently alike in any way, and I was like, well, it, well, of course they look alike because they're the same kind of map of a complex system that's really messy. And so we have two complex, messy maps that our brains tend to assume are very similar when in fact the details of the map and the content are very different. Um, but of course, as we started working on it, we found, okay, well, dreams are part of the cosmos too. And we're all part of the cosmos, too. So they're actually a bit more related than I thought, but not necessarily because of how they looked when diagrammed out. <laughs> yeah. Good Thank point. You. Good point. Uh, my, ne my next question is actually for, for the artist. So did we have some, Did you want to weigh in? I'll pass. Oh, <laughs> I want to take one more step at the same question, because I think the, um, so Dan and I work, work, uh, work together with, with Pea and Corey, who's out in the, the audience. Um, you know, I think we, uh, a, a comment on the sign back in the corner, which is from Joel's project, uh, said, you know, they discussed these, these relationships but conc concluded that uh, quickly that the differences superseded uh, the similarities. Um, and I think that was our experience also that the, um, I mean, I, I think 
uh, you know, Esther is the one who can say, but, but part of the, um, there is a visual similarity between networks of neurons and, uh, and the kind of filamentary structure of, of the distribution of galaxies. Uh, but the origin is quite different, and in particular, uh, the, the filamentary structure of galaxies comes out of um, the, the large-scale action of gravity acting on a sort of random blobby uh, initial conditions, and, and Mark is one of the, the experts on, on how this, this transformation from a kind of general blobbiness to these sort of filaments and walls and, and structures uh, occurs. Whereas the neurons are really building up through local processes. It's not, there's nothing in the brain that allows you know, this piece to directly respond to something far away. So the difference between local uh, and, and large-scale gravitational is, is a very fundamental difference in the origin of structure, even if it leads to uh, a kind of similar sort of, of structure in the end. Um, we focused a lot on, on activity uh, and, and the kind of, of activity that's, that's present, uh, that's still going on in the brain, even if it appears to be at rest, and that's also kind of going on all the time in, in the universe, um, even, uh, even when that appears to be uh, at rest. And so in the, the sound in, in our piece, a lot of it has, uh, some of it comes from uh, kind of sonifications of brainwave activity, and some of it comes from sonifications of, of black hole mergers emitting gravitational waves. Um, so that was sort of a point of similarity for us, but even there, um, I think we felt like the, the big difference is uh, is again in sort of local interactions that within, that within the brain, you know, some activity triggers other activity nearby and you get these kind of large scale coherent things. Whereas in the universe, there are events, but those events are, uh, are not able to directly stimulate each other. Um, and so, so you don't get that same kind of, of coherent pattern in time. So those were, were kind of, um, uh, I think in the end, our piece played off as, as much on the differences as on the, the similarities. Did you want to add to that? Thing? Yeah, thank you. I agree, and I think this idea of, of maps is, is a really important thing, because if the differences do outweigh the similarities, but they both are somehow seem similar in a map, maybe that's because maps are a human attempt at understanding these things, at representing these things. And the attempt to understand the vastness and the complexities of the universe, and the attempt to understand the vastness and the complexities of the, brain, of the brain, they do have something in common. And I think part of what's in common is that these entities that we as scientists, as people, are trying to understand are things that are hard to grasp, they're hard to measure. You have to work yourself up to some understanding of it and then see if that stands the test of time. Does the map hold after new discoveries? And the way that you do that, um, of using instruments that measure things directly, measure things from afar, I think is actually quite common between the, between the two. So from a scientific point of view, there are some similarities. And it strikes me that maybe it's not a coincidence that many of the pieces end up using projection, right? Because what is projection? It's a way of taking a very complicated multidimensional structure and rendering it into something that the human mind can grasp and conceptualize. And that's what we do in science, and I think that's what a lot of these pieces do here. I, I really appreciate that, uh, that summary uh, discussion there. I, it, it does sort of bring it to, to, to our understanding that for those from different fields trying to understand another field, it's always a challenge. I mean, I'm a, I'm a biologist by training, and, and so grasping some of the concepts of physics, physics astrophysics in particular, uh, are a little more challenging for me, given that uh, the, the breadth of knowledge I have in biology doesn't equal that in, in physics. Um, but the artists were, although all of you were um, experienced in dealing with science in some capacity, and I think you all have worked in, in the science realm in one way or another, um, had you ever tried to bridge two fields of research and what were the challenges that you experienced? I'd like to hear a little bit about your process for engaging the scientists in the two fields, and then how you used your medium to connect those two, um, those two dots. Hi, 
So it was both um, a really amazing process and, and also incredibly challenging. I think for all of us, um, A, to sort of uh, determine a shared language, um, B, because I think we're all uh, used to, we have a certain degree of domain expertise, and so uh, and there was some overlap, but also just you know being used or being accustomed to uh, having a really comprehensive understanding of a space, and then coming into actually having to negotiate that with other people was a really, I think, remarkable part of this process. Um, we had a few different <laughs> techniques, I guess, or mechanisms that we employed to, uh, to try and bridge that gap. And so we communicated really regularly. In fact, I was extraordinarily sort of impressed with the <laughs> uh, determination of everybody in our group to kind of um, maintain open communication. Um, then we also, I think, so, so one of the, I think, really brilliant moments of our project was when we discovered that the um, uh, sort of two-dimensional projection of the branching structures of neurons were akin to the branching structures of the cosmic web, which I think none of us had realized at that point. And it came about because Mark had given a workshop at the Tate Modern in London and saw an image, a neuroscience book in uh, the bookshop that had, I guess you would know the neuroscientist, but like one of the canonical images <laughs> of um, like, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was, it was this sort of like amazing sort of watershed moment. Um, and so we had a lot of moments like that where I think that we would all independently experience things and bring that sort of experience through the group and realize that there was actually a lot more overlap than we realized. Taya? What was the question? <laughs> well, what was the, pre what was the process for engaging scientists from different fields and how did you use your medium yeah. to bridge that? So I got brought in a little bit late on this project and there were already meetings set up when I joined. <laughs> but over the process of our project, maintaining those and figuring out how often we wanted to meet, this, this feels like boring logistical stuff, but um, I think that thinking back on the process of the development for this project personally, one of like my biggest regrets is that I didn't get to come and like actually like see your lab in person and be part of more of those early discussions. So I feel like I'd have a lot more to say if I had been. But the interactions that we did have and trying to go through our, our artist group, we came up with a ton of different concepts, like a ton of different concepts. And we went through a multi-week, maybe even like a, a couple of months phase of trying to iterate through those and figure out how to make them make sense. Like how, would they gonna be, how are they gonna be feasible? Try to gel them. We found certain concepts were more alike than different and we merged them together. And I guess we did our own like, if you were to map the concept creation phase for this, it might resemble like a cosmic web itself. But um, over that process, when we finally got to the place where, okay, I think we're ready to like show our scientists some of these, um, I think we had like the opposite kind of interaction than you guys did. <laughs> but when we finally had a few concepts that we tried to nail down, we were pretty surprised by some of the feedback. We had one idea where we had, um, oh, we want to have a bunch of objects and they're going to be um, like, a, like an old rotary phone. You pick it up and it's the universe calling. And then of course, like, well, this makes science look old. And they were like, I didn't even think of that. Like, you're right. And so it, it was, it was pretty rewarding and awesome trying to finding this concept that you guys really liked and then making it work for this and making it check off all the boxes and through the limitations that you guys gave us, we came up with something that was way better, I think, than the original and um, a bit more creative and space filling and immersive. So is that? <laughs> yeah, go. Yeah. Um, so we had a very like collaborative process as well. Um, Mark bought an Oculus Quest. Miguel also bought a Quest, but had already been working a little bit in VR, and VR is one of the mediums that I think I'm probably most familiar with at this point. Um, and so we 
there was a, a serious like co-creation thing happening, which I thought was really cool. Like we were like all working on each other's scripts and like it felt very collaborative. Yeah. I think that like from the start all the way through the end, which I think was maybe not, it's a way to work and I, I'm, I'm glad that our group was able to kind of do that. I mean, it takes uh, people with aligned skill sets, I think, and it just so happened that um, we had that, but it was cool. Okay, I'd like to, I'm gonna bring Forrest into the conversation here with a, a different question, but along the same lines. Uh, how many different trials did it take before you settled on your final concept? And can you tell us a little bit about that concept and what the inspiration was for it? Yeah, thank you. I feel like the iteration process was, I felt like an artist, like a fish out of water in this situation. I'm not a, not a neurobiologist, nor am I a physicist, but I work a lot with scientists. So I really have learned just to listen and be a sponge. And our conversation was immediately focused on the fact that these two sciences only had superficial similarities. But both gentlemen, Joel and Olaf on the video, are incredibly smart and incredibly love teaching. So I spent a lot of time listening and asking questions and really feeling like a sponge. And so I found, if you look back in the back of the room, you can see the video. I found a substrate that I could use to project their knowledge upon that had never been seen before as a, I guess, theatrical surface, projected surface. So I made a bubble sculpture and projected their movies that they had shared with me onto the surface and then recorded that. So I'm recording the dance of the photons that are undulating in the bubbles because I felt like that was my experience as the artist. And then I drew them. They didn't know I was going to draw them because <laughs> Esther didn't want there to be traditional artwork. So I drew them and then hid it in my video. So this is a, a surprise to all of you because you have to stay true to your illustration roots, right? Oh, thanks. So, um, well, I haven't read this all the way through yet before, but um, okay. So he, he just had a comment. Um, the, the cosmic web as an interconnected system reminds us of neurons in the brain. Not only that, but the architecture of the cosmic web itself may in part be responsible for the emergence of life in our galaxy. Um, our conscious brain with its billions of neurons is the result of our galaxy evolving in a special place within this cosmic web. So this is the sheet that Joel mentioned. Um, uh, a special place within the cosmic web that uh, allowed it to sustain life. <laughs> Good, thank you. Thanks, Miguel. So Joel alluded to this earlier. Uh, I'm, I can't imagine that you're willingness to participate in this project does not indicate a certain curiosity um, just scientifically as well as um, perhaps artistically. Um, how had you thought about the similarities between the brain and the universe prior to this project and how has this project changed that? I think Joel had a few words about that but about thinking about it more in a network way but um, did others have a change in their thoughts, or did it confirm something you already believed? Uh, so I think the the part about sort of neuron webs versus cosmic webs and and local uh, things being determined locally versus uh, versus from large scale. Uh, large-scale interactions. I think to some extent, I had probably thought about a little bit before, but definitely, you know, the, the title of the project uh, got me thinking, thinking more about that. Um, I would say the, um, the new thing that I hadn't thought about previously, but uh, was when, uh, when Dan and I started talking about this, uh, you know, kind of brainwave patterns at, at, at rest and the sort of gravitational wave patterns through, through the universe. So I'm seeing how that same kind of difference between uh, local interactions and, um, 
uh, and, and the great distances and, and lack of causality that, that happens as a result in, in cosmology, um, that, that that same difference you know, also made for these very, different, the very big differences in the, in the kinds of, uh, of patterns of activity that you can get in time um, as well as in space. Um, digressing a little bit, but not entirely, I uh, wanted to comment on, on another kind of, uh, of network, um, which is how, uh, how this particular set of people uh, turned out to be the ones involved. And so I don't know how this happened on, on, on the neuroscience side or on the, uh, on the, the art side. Um, but, but I think on the astrophysics side that, that here we had more of this kind of uh, local interaction network um, that uh, I suspect it, was, it must have been either Joel or Jeff Kruk, uh, who was originally brought in and then said, oh, you know, you should get David Weinberg because he's, he's done some, some art stuff too. And then I think I'm the one who said, well, you should get Mark Nyring because uh, he really uh, knows a lot about the, uh, the cosmic web and is interested in origami and, and artistic connections. And you should get Benedict Diemer because I knew about the artwork that he had done uh, in, in collaboration with a, a textile artist. And then I presume it's Mark probably who brought in Bridget Falk from, from Johns Hopkins. Um, so at least on the, um, I think on the, the astrophysics side, you can see that, that, you know, kind of starting at one place, then there were all these local interactions that, that could, could uh, bridge out and end up with this, this network of people who are here on the stage. On the neuroscience side, I believe that the group of us were the ones who answered Esther's email. I think that's how it was selected. <laughs> but it's been a tremendous pleasure to do it. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you all, some of you had done some artistic work before, and there's a recent article that talks about the, uh, the high percentage of Nobel laureates who are also known for having a particular artistic talent. Do you think that there is something about this connection between artistic uh, interest, curiosity, and acumen, and um, the ability to conduct good research? I think the bottom line of this is that artists and scientists are looking for creative solutions to innovate. Where I may show up to a blank canvas or a blank page in my sketchbook and say I need to build a world from nothing, a scientist, scientist that I work with, Joel and Olaf, in this case, looked at this and told me about, hey, there are solutions that we need to make and things that we need to connect from ultimately a blank canvas. We need to communicate an idea. We need to illuminate an idea. And so this is a wonderful collaboration where they're using artists to illuminate these bigger processes, but scientists and artists alike are looking for innovation. On this particular topic, I have to shout out to my mom who's back here and wrote her dissertation on aesthetic inquiry. Um, her name is Leslie Kenyon, PhD. <laughs> and um, if I recall the um, incredibly complex stuff that she told me about when I was in high school when we were going over her dissertation together, um, the arts as a means of exploring scientific ideas goes all the way back to, I think, the beginning of both arts and sciences. And in fact, I was reading, a, I've been reading an incredible book actually called Tending the Wild about um, the indigenous uh, wilderness management in California before the colonial era. The colonial era. And there's a description of, um, this method of just finding out when the solstices and equinoxes were, like when you got to a new place. And it's some, like that kind of thing is such a part of like the earliest rock art. It's the two things have been the same for so long. And for me personally, I've always been interested in both art and science deeply. And they both come from a place of just wanting to understand what's around me more than anything. So it's curiosity in a way.
that drives it. Uh, so I just want everyone to know you should have received a card um, in your seat and you're welcome to write a question on there and have that passed up and I'm, I'll be glad to read that um, when they come in. Uh, and I'm going to transition and ask a question that I asked in a recent phone call with some one of the teams here today, um, but it really is a personal question and I want to see how you respond to it. It's, it really is built on a great quote by a uh, wonderful scientist, Carl Sagan, but also a science communicator. Uh, and the quote is, we are all star stuff. So that essentially indicates that every atom in our body uh, is actually the product of star work. And, and so there really is no distinction between the cosmos and the human brain and the consciousness that has arisen from the human brains. Therefore, the universe does have a consciousness. I'd like to know, did, did you try to draw a line between the cosmos and human brain, and where did you draw that line? Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, we, well, we talked a lot about orders of magnitude, and so it was interesting, the comment you made about mapping earlier, where we do have these similar mappings, or the sort of morphological similarities between these systems exist, and yet they are significant orders of magnitude apart, which is, I think, part of what makes them interesting. Um, so yeah, we definitely did draw that line. Um, in fact, almost every conversation we had was about trying to determine where that line was and trying to push it a little bit further and further. What do you guys think? Um, I will say, I, I came into this with more of an emphasis on uh, the fundamental differences between physics and biology, where physics uh, is, there are these unifying principles that can account for just an incredible range of phenomena across many spatial scales. And for biology, the, the sort of theoretical construct that underlies so much of why organisms are the way they are is evolution and natural selection. And that leads to not unification, but diversity and adapting to a changing environment. And so it seems that at that level, the nature of an explanation in physics and the nature of an explanation in biology are really quite different. And uh, so it was, it was really delightful for me when Mark started talking about some of these similarities that he discovered about the geometrical patterns at these two different levels. And uh, I think helped me to sort of focus more on the, the bridging concepts, the, the linking concepts across these different fields and, and not so much on the uh, fundamental differences in, in the, the structure of the explanations. Yeah, so I, um, when I came into this, um, I had, um, well, I had, I had noted the, like a lot of people, um, that there was a visual similarity between the networks, but I, I was a little, uh, I had no idea why they should be, uh, the similar, and we, we still don't really know really why. But um, I think even though evolution is the driver in biology, it, it also, there are corollaries to it, like you, you want efficient systems, um, and uh, that, that kind of has a parallel in, in, in physics, of course. Um, so the, the neurons want to um, communicate with as little material as possible and um, as, I guess, as quickly as possible. Uh, and well, in the universe, um, this is a kind of vague statement, but, but the, the cosmic web is kind of a, a, a way for, the uni for matter to fall into, um, ultimately into galaxies, and it's a relatively efficient way of doing that. Um, and so it's kind of the universe trying to <laughs> make, make galaxies and stars and things. It, we, I mean, obviously that's over -per personified, but um, but that's that's one way that it's not really a falsifiable statement in some ways. It, well, there are parts of it that are falsifiable scientifically, like you can maybe show that something is optimal in some way, but without the the kind of emotional the way. With, personification, it, I think that, that provides a more full understanding for, for humans, and we're, after all, we're, even scientists are humans, <laughs> even if we try to pretend that our ideas are independent of humans. So I do think this, this idea is really interesting of how organisms 
brains inside organisms relate to the you know, much larger scale structure around us, including the universe. We're obviously part of the universe and product of the universe. But I think a really interesting aspect is how little of that structure and energy and form of the universe we can directly see and feel ourselves, right? Of all the electromagnetic spectrum, how much of it can we see? Of the processes around us at, certain, at varying distances, we're only sensitive to things that are you know, near enough to us to generate signals that fall within the visible range or sound you know, that we can hear. And everything else, much of which is incredibly interesting, about the structure of the universe, the energy that exists in gravitational waves and radio and uh, light outside of what we can see is bombarding us all the time, but we can't sense it. And I think a lot of the process of science has been building the tools that are needed to detect those things that we can't detect ourselves. And this positions us and our nervous systems you know, in, a, in a place where we can now sense and recognize what's happening with, around us. So even though we're part of it, we're only seeing a very small fraction of it, and part of the challenge of doing science is expanding what we can see and how we understand. <clears throat> I was just going to make a few comments about the star stuff. Uh, so, first of all, uh, aside from the hydrogen that comes right out of the Big Bang, as uh, Carl Sagan said and Jamie Vernon quoted, uh, we're all star stuff. In other words, we're made of stuff that is made in stars or by stellar processes. Uh, so how much of that stuff is there? And the answer is it's less than a hundredth of one percent of the density of the universe. The other stuff besides the hydrogen and helium that comes out of the Big Bang and the dark matter and dark energy that are most of the density of the universe. Uh, so the Earth and we are made of stuff that was made in various stellar processes. All of us are about two-thirds by mass oxygen, mostly in the form of water. That oxygen is made in supernovas, massive stars that explode at the ends of their short lives. But the carbon is mostly not from supernovas. It's mostly from the late stage evolution of smaller stars. So all the different elements come in different ways. And one of the things that's very interesting is that the mixture that leads to the formation of different planetary systems can be substantially different and can have a big impact on whether those systems can support complex life. That's something that we're still trying to figure out. Anyway, the whole star stuff stuff is very closely related to us and then one more little comment uh, related to uh, what Dan was just saying. Uh, so the stuff that glows, that we can actually see with our eyes, stars, glowing nebulae, that represents less than 10% of the ordinary matter of the universe, which itself is only 5%. So in other words, everything we can see, at least with our eyes and with telescope eyes, Everything is half of 1% of the cosmic density. So it wasn't obvious how the universe worked until fairly recently when we've been able to combine the ability to see all kinds of other phenomena, including non-electromagnetic like gravity waves, together with theory based on physics and things like that. So uh, it's been a great adventure to figure these things out. And of course, the neuroscientists are still deeply involved in a similar kind of adventure, trying to figure out how we can actually figure things like that out. Uh, that, that, actual, that last comment is actually similar to one of the questions that came from the audience. Uh, and maybe, maybe you experienced something or you understood, maybe particularly in the artist side, but maybe uh, neuroscientists compared to astrophysicists. Uh, which do you feel we know more about? The brain or the universe? The universe. <laughs> um, it's, it's easier. It's so much easier. Well, I, would, I think that, uh, yeah, there, there are still, uh, I mean, it sounds like a silly answer when, as, as Joel said, most of, the matter, uh, most of the density of the universe is dark matter, and we don't know what that is, and dark energy, and we don't know what that is. Um, but still, you know, we have a, um, uh, we do have a 
physical picture uh, of the universe that explains to a remarkable degree uh, a lot of the, the stuff that, that we observe. I think uh, one of the similarities we found in our discussion between neuroscience and, and, uh, and cosmology was, was about the way they, they operate scientifically that the, um, I have a friend who describes astronomy as the science where you look but don't touch. Uh, because we, we don't get to do experiments uh, in, in going in and, and manipulating things. Uh, the universe has done the experiment and we try to you know, get whatever happens to come our way and figure out what happened. Um, and I think that is somewhat true in the study of the brain as well, you know, particularly the human brain, uh, that uh, people are understandably uh, reluctant to go in and fiddle around too much. And so a lot of the progress has come from from taking the, you know, the degree of, of uh, stuff that we can sense from the outside and trying to figure out what's, what's going on within. Um, it's astonishing the degree to which the, um, the sort of electro, uh, electrical and chemical pathways of, by which uh, neurons communicate has been figured out. Um, but I would say the, the jump from there to, to how we think um, still seems like a, 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 bigger, uh, a, a bigger gap than, than the jump from you know, how the small fluctuations in the early universe grew by gravity into the, the structure that we see. Um, this gives me the opportunity to tell a nerdy joke about different sciences. Um, so uh, there's the predictive power of physics is just so much greater than anything in biology. And uh, the joke is that uh, physicists uh, talk about how many significant digits they have in the precision of their models. And chemists, some types of chemistries, um, they're, they get within an order of magnitude of the predicted result, and that's a success. In biology, we're just trying to get the sign right. Does it go up or to go down when we make our manipulation? And a lot of times we predict that there'll be an increase in whatever we're measuring and there's a decrease. And it's at that level of precision often that we're struggling to understand the, the phenomena that we're interested in. Thank you. This is an interesting question and given the uh, venue today, I, I'm a little apprehensive about asking it, but I think I'm gonna pose it anyway. <clears throat> there is some suggestion that um, religious imagery has presented the origin of the universe, the origin of life, in a very specific way. Um, the work that you've done today, or that we're presenting today, um, how do we, how do we in integrate the factual, science-based in information that we have compared to the stories that we learn through religion? And going forward into the future, how are we going to be able to present, uh, whereas stained glass and paintings have been the story of the past, how do we tell it going towards the future using new media? I work in advertising. <clears throat> um, I really believe strongly in stories a lot. And I think that's the most interesting thing about religion is the power to bring people together with stories. And it's also the most terrifying thing about religion because you have the power to manipulate people with stories and to justify things with stories. And I think that when we're making science art, we're telling stories about science and we can use those stories to make people love or hate science, love or hate things about science. Um, do things that are science related to to care about things not because of the scientific facts necessarily but because of how they're presented and I think that there's a, a it's very tempting to equate science and religion but I think that the thing they have in common is stories. And that when you have a conversation about those two things, what you're really talking about is stories. Great, I think that should just soak in for a minute. I think it's good. 
Um, given that question about how we're going to convey and tell stories into the future, and you, uh, there's a lot of interesting media that's being used today, projections and virtual reality and so on. Um, one thing that appears to be missing from the, the, the suite of presentations we see is anything in, on the order of sound. Did anyone think about using sound? Oh, did I miss one? Oh, I, well, can you talk about your use of sound in, in your piece and, and the concept and how, that, um, how that's different from the visual projection? So being on the science side of this, I wasn't responsible for producing the sound, but we had a great team, um, including, we, we had a great team, including um, someone who specifically was working on, on sonifying these, uh, you know, signals from neuroscience and from astrophysics. Um, so I think one of the things that you can see if you explore this exhibit with the sleeping fox is that there's sound that's being produced and that sound is sometimes the sound of the universe and it's sometime, sometimes the sounds of neurons in the brain from actual sampling of real biological measurements of brain activity. Um, and I think sound is a, obviously it's an incredibly rich medium that can convey a lot of complexity, a lot of reaction, a lot of dynamics, and these are things that characterize activity in the brain. As, as scientists, these are aspects of activity that we work very hard to try to understand. And likewise, in the universe, a lot of the patterns that are analyzed in order to figure out, you know, what the fundamental rules are, are patterns, you know, they're about dynamics, they're about time, which naturally maps onto sound. So maybe, Taya, you want to add more to that, but it's definitely in there. Our soundscape artist, his name is Yagiz. He couldn't be here today, unfortunately, but I know that um, for a long time, we brought him in even later than me, and we really went through a lot of rounds thinking about what the audio should be here. And one of the very early concepts, of course, was like a very audio intensive one that you guys were both enthusiastic about. So we knew we wanted to bring that in somewhere. And when we brought in Yegi's, uh, I was just so thrilled that he was able to bring that all together. I think it sounds great. <laughs> it's, yeah. And part of the reason that, that we sort of focused on, on sound as one of the media early on was, was specifically one of the biggest developments in astrophysics over the last few years has been the direct detection of gravitational waves, uh, which are you know, ripples in, in space time, um, but are detected by by means that, that really have quite a lot of, of close analogy with, with hearing um, and, and these pulses of waves that are produced by black hole mergers or neutron star mergers are often described as chirps because, uh, because they have this kind of rising uh, that, that if you just translate it almost directly uh, uh, into a sound wave, sounds like a chirp. And so, uh, so the fox um, is, uh, is dreaming of brains and the cosmos, but in a, in a soundscape uh, in which there's uh, the, the, uh, the kind of neuronal activity has been, has been translated into something that might you know, sound like distant thunderstorms, but the, uh, it's really the gravitational wave chirps that, that might be the birds uh, or, or the insects uh, that this fox is hearing. So um, we actually also have an audio component that is... Um, it's, it's really a critical pass, part of our piece. And um, so the, the piece is about connection and, and uh, sort of connection and developing networks. And in it, we ask every user uh, a question. And the question is, what was the last time you felt connected? Where were you? What were you doing? Tell us a story. Again, to the power of stories um, and sort of like presenting these, these kind of narratives sort of contextualized within time and space. Um, and so that was, I think, a really, really key component for us. It, there, were, there were going to be more questions and we kind of like condensed it down. And I think the other component there is sort of this participatory aspect uh, where we wanted users to sort of contribute to a data set of, of audio that we could then um, process, like do keyword analysis and, and sort of natural language processing on at a later date and probably share out in a, more, in a wider way. 
Um, so yeah, definitely a key. And so the other thing too is that it's, um, it's in a virtual environment and it's really, really important to use audio cues in VR because it helps users feel more immersed. So there was some very last minute um, <laughs> kind of stitching together of audio to kind of bring the piece together and I think it really helped a lot. I, I had a question for you guys actually. So one of the, I, I run a science fiction book club and a book that I read recently that I really, really, really loved um, is called Silently and Very Fast by Catherine Volanti. And it, it's about uh, an AI that is dreaming and the whole, it, it reads like this absolute poetry. And so I was curious about um, your piece in, in sort of constructing these dreams of a fox or a creature. How did you design that? How did you think about that? Okay. First, can I join your science fiction book club? Because <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay, send me an invite. <laughs> um, how, did, how did we get the dream the fox dream forest thing together okay i'm gonna have to write down the book you mentioned as well <laughs> okay uh yeah so we we like i mentioned earlier we went through an iterative um concepting phase which is something that we do a lot in creative advertising and that's where i brought it in from um where we come up with a bunch of ideas and sit with them a little bit rank them um iterate on them a little bit further, try to figure out how to make them a little bit more conceptually refined. And if I went through all of the thinking and process behind where this concept ended up, I'd accidentally be doing some of the things that were the reasons we didn't do earlier versions of the concept. So I'm gonna maybe um, pass this with on and see how much you wanna <laughs> How much do you want to say about this? <laughs> I mean, we had so many early ideas, but a lot of them involved, um, you know, this idea that one of the brain's main jobs is perception. And perception is a reaction to things happening around. And so our fox is sleeping, but perhaps if it was awake, it would be seeing the stars and the stars would generate activity in that fox's brain, which would then maybe appear on the screen or as part of the dream, and so it would be this interactive loop. And, and we were very excited for a long time in discussions with the team about ways that this could be implemented, um, including, I think, um, you know, visitors um, with, you know, being monitored, as you saw, you know, you can interact somehow with this, but that can be even more complex in more ways. And then I think we decided for a practical reason that this seemed like you know, a good way to build it that we can get many of the themes of dynamics and reactivity, um, but let's allow the animal to have some rest. Yeah. Great, I'm glad you mentioned perception in that one because I actually have a question from an audience member who is a neurobiology professor. And she says, and this may be um, directed to the artist, but I'm just curious from everyone. When she gives her lectures on how we perceive color, to her students, they tell her that she's ruined the magic. Um, I'd like to hear how, and she would like to hear how you respond to that from an artistic perspective and then maybe those on the, the other scientists on the panel. You already knew I had something to say. <laughs> Personally, I feel that the fact that when you start to learn about how we perceive colors, you have more questions than you did when you started, and that is the magic. That is the magic to me. And that's why I love science so much. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what I got on that. I'm, because I have a question that has your name in it, I'd like to give you a, a moment to speak about the project as it, as it exists, maybe respond to this question about magic because I think you yourself have probably some thoughts on that. But um, the question is about how did you come up with the concept, which I tried to give a little intro to, but maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Um, well, uh, it was really an extension of uh, the first uh, science art uh, collaboration exhibition that I put together a few years ago. And it was called Mind Matters, and it was essentially uh, a collaboration between neuroscientists and, and artists. 
Um, and then, um, and because I love doing this collaborative work between scientists and artists, and I thought, how could I, how could I expand this, this idea of, you know, of scientists and artists, neuroscientists and artists, and what could I bring something really special into it? And, um, and then I'm thinking, wow, I mean, what better could it be to put together two of the most important scientific sectors together, scientific fields? I mean, right? I mean, uh, so it is really the importance of these two scientific fields on of our understanding of the world behaves, of our own behavior, of, um, I mean, I think that also when I was growing up, I used to uh, live in Beirut, Lebanon, and we used to live in the mountains. And when we uh, used to go out on our balconies and terraces, the sky was filled with beautiful stars. And the moon used to go up just behind the mountains, and the moon looked delicious and big and amazing. And so that has always been an extreme interest for me, you know, cosmology and the stars and everything. So. So it was a no-brainer, really, at the end, oh, like the, you know, putting together uh, astrophysic, astrophysicists and neuroscientists together, I thought that it would be extremely interesting and very exciting and, and, uh, and uh, meaningful. And so I posed the question to a few of my neuroscientist friends who had collaborated with me in the beginning, and they found it to be intriguing. And then I posed that same question to some astrophysicists that happened to be um, you know, the, the parents of friends of mine, and they encouraged me, and they said that would be really amazing to do something like that. Then I posed that question, so how about parallels between above and below? And they looked at me and they said, well, I don't think we've ever looked into that one before, so why don't you go for it? <laughs> so it's just easy, like, I mean, easy like that, kind of simple for me. And it, and it was through their help and through their motivational, uh, essentially through their positive feedback, that um, that I decided to do that. And um, and then when I approached um, the scientists that are participating in our effort today, they were um, they were attuned to the idea of looking into the similarities, even though even though even though, for example, like Joel from the beginning said, oh, no, these two structures are totally different. <laughs> but, but scientists are, you know, and uh, as well as artists are amazing people because they really like to delve in the unknown. They really, really like to discuss. They're very curious. They want to learn about things. And the most important thing is they really like to share their knowledge. And, and then sharing their knowledge, uh, they do it really well in, their, in the way they do it, in their own domains and the research and papers and activities that they all do. But sharing their knowledge through the art is just an amazing thing because art has been hand in hand with science ever since we know it, ever since civilization began. And what better role can art have, right, than helping us understand the world around us? So thank you. Thank you for everyone. This has been a very enriching experience for me and humbling, to say the least. I think we're running late on time, so I'm going to say thank you, Esther, for making this possible, and thank you, everyone, for being here for the conversation. One, one thing I'd like to ask, um, because I think, the, as I alluded to at the beginning of this, that part of the reason that these types of collaborations are important is because it will help us determine ways to better communicate certain sciences to those who are not in those fields or, or to the general public. So if I were to pose a question to you today, and maybe you can talk to anyone on the panel or, come, or, or me or Esther uh, to give some feedback, has this discussion and the art helped you better understand either the organization of the brain or the universe. And thank you. <laughs>